So we've been talking a little bit about it. It's an interesting thing. I came up, <coughs> I, I remember back in the 60s, you remember the, the television series called Twilight Zone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, I think they still run some reruns on that. It was uh, one episode in 1960, and uh, it was an American who was walking on a walking trip through Central Europe, and he gets caught up into a raging storm. And staggering through the blinding rain, he chances upon an imposing medieval castle. It's a hermitage for a brotherhood of monks. The recluse monks reluctantly take him in. Later that night, the American discovers a cell with a man locked inside, and an ancient wooden staff bolts the door. The prisoner claims he's being held captive by the insane head monk. Brother Jerome, and he pleads for the American to release him. The prisoner's kindly face and gentle voice win him over, and so the American confronts Brother Jerome, who declares that the prisoner is actually none other than Satan, the father of lies, held captive by the staff of truth, the one barrier he cannot pass. This incredible claim convinces the American that her brother Jerome is indeed mad and crazy. As soon as he gets the chance, he releases the prisoner who immediately transforms into a hideous horned demon and vanishes in a puff of smoke. The stunned American is horrified at the realization of what he has done in this, in this movie, in this uh, television series. And Brother Jerome responds sympathetically, I'm sorry for you, my son. All your life you will remember this night and whom you have turned loose upon the world. The man said, I didn't believe you. I saw him and didn't recognize him. To which Brother Jerome solemnly observes, that is man's weakness and Satan's strength. Now that was a TV series yeah. in 1965. That is man's weakness <coughs> and Satan's strength. We don't see him. We don't recognize him. We don't recognize when he works. We're ignorant of his devices. We're not aware. We're not sensitive. We're not trying the spirits to see if they're of God. All of these things are a product of, well, Satan wants to blind the hearts of men and women. Well, here's a... Uh, you remember we, uh, we talked to uh, Dave, Dave brought it up um, last week uh, where we talked about the four D's. Several years ago I shared with you the strategy of Satan and I shared four D's that I thought was a, a, a process. And the first one was he, he wanted to, first of all, deceive you and deceive people, then to discourage them. And then after they're discouraged, he wants to divide them from strength and from their power, from the people of God, from the church, from fellowship. And then finally, he wants to destroy. Well, I've come, I've come across, and I want to, I want to share with you some other things. And I don't know these all. There's, there's 18 D's I'm going to talk about tonight. 18. And I, you know, I thought about, well, they all D's start with D. Well, the devil starts with D. So maybe there's some, some link there, I, I, I don't know. But the scripture says, But Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, I want to talk about 18 devices, all beginning with the letter D, that uh, hopefully will help us to be aware of the devices of the enemy. Uh, the first one is disappointment. Now, we all have disappointments in life, don't we? That's common to man. We all have disappointments. I read where one said one one person said all disappointments are really God's appointments. We can look at it in a different way. Now why should we think about that in that light? Because the scripture says, and we know. Everyone say we know. We know. Everyone say we know. We know. We know. We know. We know. We know. You see, we do know. It's not something that we're ignorant of. We know. That all things work together for good to them that love God. Is there anybody here that loves God? Amen. 
course you we love God. We're not we're not trying to walk away from God. We're here because we love God. We want to serve Him. We want to be we want to be a better uh, disciple. He says to them that love God, to them that are called according to whose purpose? His purpose. We're going to have disappointments in life. There are going to be things that you and I will face that will disappoint us in our lives. But we know, we know that even those disappointments that you and I will face, God will work them for our good. The disappointment's not good, but God will take that which you and I face, and He will turn it for our good. How many believe that? He will. I mean, there's a lot of painful things that you and I will encounter in life. There are tragedies that we will face. There will be things that we do not understand. There is no human answer for. It doesn't make sense to us. We have to remember that it's only one piece of the puzzle. And if we try to judge the whole picture by that one piece of the puzzle, it will get skewed and distorted. Because God sees the whole puzzle. And we can take that piece of puzzle and hold it up to our eye and it will block out the whole world. <coughs> God knows how to place that piece of the puzzle of our life in the right place and work it for our good. But see, the devil will use disappointment against you. He'll use that kind of disappointment against you. And so we need to be aware. We know that all things work for good to them that call, are called of God. So the first, one of the first things he uses is disappointment. The second thing is discouragement. Discouragement. It's the second stage to disappointment. We get disappointed and then we get discouraged. Do you know that in America, a lot, a lot of drugs are sold for people who are depressed and discouraged? And they're trying to lift their spirit, trying to lift their, their life. They're just, you know, they're disappointed with life. They're discouraged. Do you realize that suicide is now the number three killer of people in America? It's the number two killer of those that are 14 years old to 24. Just behind accidents. Although we don't know how many, quote, accidents are really suicides. Well, what, what's happening in our society? Well, if you eradicate God out of school, then you have no purpose. You're here by accident. You're only here because your mom, your mom didn't abort you. There's no real meaning in life. There's really no purpose. If you've been taught all your life that you're, you know, you're, you're just here by chance, there is no God. There is no heaven. There's no hope. That's why Paul said, if I, in this life I only had hope. In this life, I'd be of all men most miserable. So what's happening is that people are becoming, uh, they're becoming uh, discouraged and depressed. But the Word of God tells us in Deuteronomy 1, 21 and verse 28, it says, Fear not, neither be discouraged. You will find that passage in Deuteronomy, God speaking to Joshua again and again and again. You're facing a big city. You're facing mighty walls. You're facing mighty armies as you enter the promised land. Don't be discouraged. Don't fear. Don't be discouraged. He goes on to say, our brethren have discouraged our hearts later in that chapter. I think discouragement can have an uh, infectious uh, point to it, uh, application to it. It can be contagious. People get discouraged. He says in here, our brothers have discouraged our hearts. We're not able to go in. Discouragement. The devil would like to disappoint you. He'd love to discourage you and depress you. And yet, the Word of God says, fear not. Amen. The third one is despair. To despair is to forget. And unchecked, despair can destroy a Christian's life. See, despair is... A, is Something to forget that God is at work, that God's going on, that God has a purpose in your life and mine. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, the Word of God addresses it, but in 2 Corinthians, we need to remember, Paul says, we are troubled on every side, 
yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are perplexed. There are some things we don't understand. But we don't fall into the category of despair because we remember God is in charge of things. Right. That doesn't mean you can't be concerned. It doesn't mean you don't look around and are, are bothered by it. <coughs> but we're not pacing the floor, wringing our hands, pulling out our hair, walking the floor, saying, "There's, no, you know, I'm just in despair. You see how the devil works? He'll take disappointments. He'll try to discourage you, bring you into despair. <coughs> there's a progressive, there's, excuse me, <coughs> there's a progressiveness to this. Despair, despair. Another one here is doubt. Doubt. This is how Satan attacked Eve in the Garden of Eden. He took a statement of God's word, turned it around, and made it a question. To do what? To put doubt in her mind. Now this is one of the devices of Satan. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And he turned it into a question. Because God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You get all these except one. And uh, he doubt, she doubted the word of God. And I think the one thing that we have to look is uh, to doubt is uh, to doubt God and His goodness. God, the Satan wants to have you and I doubt God's goodness. That's what that's what he was putting in the mind of Eve. God's keeping something back good from you. Because he knows if you eat of that tree, you'll be able to decide for yourself what is good and what is evil. Deciding for you. So he wants to, us to doubt the Word of God. I've had people over the years that tell me, you know, I'm not sure that's what that Word of God says. Look, the Word of God says what it says. And you and I can't get around it. We cannot add to his Word. And we cannot take away from his Word. Now, some, some religious groups will, will um, take away from the Word of God and say, well, it doesn't really mean that. And then other groups will add to the Word of God and say, well, here, here's some things that you need to do. I know we can't find it in the Scripture, but you're going to have to do it anyway. Well, the Bible tells us, you know, God, God gave Ten Commandments, and they were pretty clear and concise, weren't they? Yes. You know, he had ten commandments, and all every one of those were good commands. It's chiseled on the wall uh, behind the Supreme Court, behind the judges. Ten commandments. Because that's all, you know, that's God's law. That's the way he wants things. But Satan would love to have us doubt. Now, what Paul said to the church, or to his, to his son in the gospel, he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. You see, the doubt is to not pray. Because if you pray about everything, then things are going to change. He says, now I want you to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath, or anger, and what? Doubting. Doubting. Pray. Lift up holy hands. And don't doubt that God is still in charge. God is still in control. Don't give the devil a foothold into your life by causing you to doubt the Word of God. Now, did he not say, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Did he say that? Of course. But see, Satan will come along and try to get you to doubt that. Well, he, he may not leave somebody else, but he's, you know, seems to me he's kind of forsaken me. See, that's the enemy. We're not ignorant of his devices. So we don't want to get into a point where we are, we are allowing disappointment or discouragement or despair or doubt to get into our lives. Those are devices that Satan uses. All right, the four, fifth one is disbelief. It is the ultimate end of doubt to get you to not believe the Word of God, to not believe this, this Bible. 
this manual for life. It'll get you to disbelieve God and His faithfulness. God is faithful. And He is just. And He doth all things well. Hebrews 3 and 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief in departing from the living God. See, what happens when you start unbelieving, you'll depart from the living God. When you disbelieve. You know, you'll come across people that maybe once were in church, say, well, I believe in God. No, you don't. Because belief has actions, doesn't it? You may have an acknowledgement of God, but there's a difference in acknowledging that there is a God and believing God. Because you can't believe God unless you believe His Word. Does that make sense? You've got to believe His Word. It's, it's an active. Believe is that. Unbelief is also active, and it has characteristics and qualities. And what happens when people start to not believe anymore, they depart from the living God. Amen? It first starts departing and not associating with uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Then the next thing, it's departing from the church family. Next thing, I can worship God at home just as well as I can worship God at church. That's the rationale. Well, what's going on there? Well, there may be several factors, but one of them is unbelief. Unbelief. So unbelief is very destructive, and we need to make sure that we are... We are uh, holding on to and trusting our, our, our Lord. Number six, distraction. Means to be sidetracked from God's purpose and will for your life. You know, I think this is one of the key elements that Satan uses against Christians. If he can get you sidetracked, if he can get you off, you know, just enough skewed off the, off the track that you're not doing God's will for your life, you're not serving the Lord like you should. You're distracted by a lot of things. Remember the four soils? The third kind of soil is that it grew up. The thorns and thistles grew up with it. So that it did not produce. It looked good on the outside. Except that it didn't have any fruit. And then Jesus explained that these thorns and thistles that grew up with the wheat were the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. And they didn't produce any fruit. And I think that so many times, many Christians are being distracted by the things that are around them so that they're not producing the fruit of God in their lives that they need to produce. It's one of the tricks, it's one of the devices of Satan to get you and me off track of being what God wants us to be and doing His will. Well, it's just one of His devices that we need to be aware of. <clears throat> the real enemy of the best is not the worst, but the good. The real enemy of the best is second best. Satan would be okay with you having second best as long as you don't have God's best. He's okay with you lowering your expectations. Remember Matthew 14 and 30, Apostle Peter, Jesus calls him, he gets out of the boat, starts walking on water. As long as he fixed his eyes on Jesus Christ, he was okay. He's walking on water. But the Bible says that when he looked around and saw the winds boisterous and the waves crashing up against him, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. He was distracted by the wind and the waves. Can I tell you tonight that as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll be okay. You'll be fine. The wind may be blowing. The waves may be crashing. Life may be in chaos around you. But keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and you will not be distracted. And I will tell you, you'll be able to walk on that which is around you. In trust and faith. Amen? Amen. Alright, number seven. <coughs> Abracadabra. There we go. See? Alright. Number seven. Double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. It means double-souled. Or to forget God at times. 
you know, this week is good and God is great. Next week, I'm deciding which day I want to backslide. <laughs> you know, double-mindedness. The Bible says, James says, a double-minded man is unstable in how many of his ways? Aww. All of his ways. Double-mindedness is the attack of the enemy to get you and me to be double-minded. You know, we're at, we're at church on Sunday morning. Hey, God's great. Come Monday morning, where is God? Well, He was the same God that was with you the day before. Double-minded to keep you off guard, to keep you unstable in everything of your life. It's one of the disadvices of Satan. Scripture says in James 4, 8, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Purify your hearts. Get your heart right. Trust God. Believe God. Don't be double-minded. And I think the key to what he says here is draw nigh to God. And He'll draw nigh to you. And if you'll draw nigh, if you and I will draw nigh to God, then we won't be double-minded because we will purify our hearts uh, with His presence. Amen? Amen. Number eight, dishonesty. Dishonesty can be lying, cheating, holding back fat, stealing from God and others. <coughs> dishonesty. The scripture has a lot to say about us living our lives honestly. I guess we could say, we could even use the term integrity. Having integrity and honesty. It's like the word of God says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything more than that will produce some, <coughs> some sin. It will cause damage. You know? When we start going down to but Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 2, but we have renounced the what? Hidden, Hidden things of dishonesty. Because dishonesty is always hiding things. God always got a cover up, always secrets, always this, that, and the other. And he says, We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, <coughs> nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And this was one of the points that the apostle was making to the Corinthians. There are people out there that will handle the word dishonestly and deceitfully. I read something just the other day about, uh, about this. It's estimated that over 500 million is raised each year by faith healers. People who say, I have the faith to heal you, and who cannot do what they claim. That's dishonest. Dishonest. Can God heal? Absolutely. Does he heal? Absolutely. But you know what, folks? The Bible also says it's appointed unto man once to die. We're all going to die of something. So there's going to, but that's the ultimate healing for, for a Christian. Death is the ultimate healing for a Christian. Because now we're going to get a new glorified body. But you and I are going to face things. We're going to have situations and circumstances in our lives. So we must use the word honestly. And that was one of the points he was making of people who will distort and twist and insert and do things to just add to the word of God, to distort it, to make it a little dishonest. And it was, it was true in God, uh, uh, Paul's day. He says, do you know that there's some people that believe that gain is godliness? That natural material gain means you're more spiritual than anybody else? That if you're, quote, blessed in material things, that you you and God got, got it all, all worked out, don't you? You and Jesus. And he says there are those who will preach the word for their own selfish gain. And then there are others who will think that gain is godliness, that they're just more spiritual than somebody else who doesn't quite have what they have. That's dishonest. That's dishonest. The Bible addresses those who have, have wherewith and those who don't. He says, God is no respecter of persons. How many know that? Amen. Now, God wants to bless us. I'm not saying that. God wants to bless us. It's the thinking that because you are blessed, that you're in, you're, you're in good and tight with God more than somebody else. And that may not be the case. I thank God for all of his blessings. 
Amen. I know there's none of the blessings that I have are deserved right. and uh, that I'm worthy of, but I thank the Lord for them. Amen. Amen. So he says, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So he says, we want to live a life that is not dishonest, but we want to, we want to do that. You know, what happens with dishonesty is that the next step to that, that being dishonest is greed. And uh, greed can take over a person's life and it'd be sad, a sad thing. Uh, nine, deceit. Deceit is a concealment or distortion of the truth for the purpose of misleading. Duplicity, fraud, to trick, to the, the practice of deceit, of deceiving. You know, uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians tells us, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, that's the man of sin, the man of perdition. You're going to come with all deceivableness and unrighteousness. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not for we are not as many which corrupt the word, word of God. Um, and he's talking about there's very few that just did, don't teach, teach the word of God out of deceit. He says, Therefore we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, the scripture that I just shared with you, and not craftiness or deceit. Again, deceit, dishonesty, craftiness. But we've not handled the word of God deceitfully. We've not handled the word of God deceitfully. Second John 1 7 tells us, For many deceivers are entered into the world. Many deceivers, not a few, but many deceivers are in the world. To be deceived is, uh, is to forget God. The Bible says the heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and who can know it? Well, we know our God knows it. But he's telling us what kind of heart we have without the power of the Holy Ghost. Without redemption. Without being born again. And having a different heart. Psalm 139, 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. The word here is anxious thoughts. God, know me. Know my heart. See what's in there. David went on to say, See if there be any wicked way in me. You know, sometimes we think we know ourselves and we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do, but God knows us. And He knows what's in our heart. So we want to make sure that uh, we are not being deceived or deceiving anybody else. The next one here is number 10 is dullness. Means sleepiness to the things of God. Dullness. Dullness. You know, people can be dull in the house of God. They were in Paul's day. He says in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, he said, for, uh, verses 12 through 14, for when, for when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You've got to go back to the beginning and start all over again, because your dullness is coming through. And he says, and are become as such as a need milk and not of strong meat. So he's saying the dullness in your heart and in your life is not allowing you to capture the things that you need to capture in your life. It affected the church in Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, And I believe I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as to babes in Christ. <coughs> I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hereto you are not able to bear it, Neither yet are you able now, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? What does it mean, walking as men? He says you're walking like unbelievers. Carnality is manifested. And here are the things that he says that manifests carnality. In other words, in discipleship, I draw a line. Here's, a, here's an unbeliever. Here's a new believer. They're all on the same line. Here's somebody that doesn't know Christ. Here's somebody that's just been born again. They don't know anything. Really. Then you can have a spiritual growth upward. Or if you go straight, 
That's what the Bible says, carnality. The carnal, the carnal man is on the same level as the unbeliever and the babe in Christ. There's no growth, but he says there, there's evidences of that carnality. There's envy. There's strife. There's jealousies. There's divisions. He says, are you not carnal and walk as men? You know, to suffer dullness is to forget God. He says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing, dullness. Not listening, not receiving, not opening up your heart to the Word of God, not receiving it. It's dullness of hearing, dullness of heart. <clears throat> That's one of Satan's devices, dullness. He puts you to sleep. You know, there was a man in the book of Acts. Well, I will give, give it up. Paul was preaching all night long. He went hour after hour and hour, about the middle of the night, the man, or early in the morning. The, Man fell asleep and fell out the window. Broke his neck. Paul went down and prayed for him and restored him back to life. God restored him back to life. But uh, dullness is just, you know, being sleepy, being dull. The next one, number 11, is deadness. Unchecked dullness leads to deadness. Think about it. One of Satan's devices, deadness. Revelation 3.1. I know your works. You have a name that says you live, but you're dead. You're deadness, dead. That was one of the seven churches. So you have a name that says you're alive, but you're not. You're dead. Now, the good news here, as the, as the Lord challenged them to overcome and uh, get live again, because he loves them. So they, but they, one of the enemy's tricks is deadness. Number 12, defame. Defame means to belittle or criticize, to slander. In fact, the uh, meaning of the word devil, devil is slander. So one of the devices that he uses, you know, if we have ought against, if we have ought against any someone, you go to them, to their face, and you resolve it. You attempt to resolve it. If they don't hear you, then you take a friend, a mature friend, and you go and say, look, brother, look, sister, I don't want there to be anything between us. I don't want there to be any barrier. I don't want there to be mis any misunderstanding. You know, I want you to forgive me if I've done something. If you know you've done it, then you spell it out. Forgive me for but you want to resolve it. In fact, Jesus taught that if you go to the altar and you find out, you remember that you have ought against somebody else, go take care of it. Then come back to the altar. See, that's what the devil, the trick of the enemy is to divide, to, to belittle and criticize, to slander. The scripture says, whosoever privately slandereth his neighbor him will I cut off, and him that hath a high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. He says, I'm not going to tolerate that. So, defame, to criticize, to uh, slander someone. Uh, that's what's happened this week with those boys from Kentucky. The media just openly, without having any facts, having not all the information, slandered those boys and defamed them. Some of the statements that were said by people toward them, I can't even tell you. It's so gross and bad. But see, that's the work of the enemy. That is a trick of Satan to, to slander. All right, well, we've got a couple more here. Let's go. D d discord or divide means to cause disunity, troublemaker, gossip, raising doubts in the minds of people. To sow, to sow discord among the church. Discord. That's what the devil wants to do in any assembly, is to sow discord and disunity among the church. But again, the church has to be the safest place on earth. It has to be. Because there is no other city of refuge. There's no other place of refuge that people can go to. If they
if it's not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number 14. Well, wait a minute. I, um, I must have... Um, well, I evidently missed a slide or moved it around. It may come up, but let me share a couple things with you. <coughs> I know it's there. I know it's there somewhere. Where is it? Huh. I know I typed it. All right. Well, it's gone. Well, let me share it with you here. Um, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Number one, a proud look. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Four, a heart that devises wicked imaginations. Five, uh, feet that be swift in running to mischief. Six, a false witness that speaketh lies. Number seven, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Those are all serious offenses toward God and the church. And he says that's one of the things that uh, Satan does is try to uh, try to get you and me to uh, um, sow discord and divide. Um, Alright, next thing is defilement with the things and the ways of the world. Let me know we can be defiled. Yep. The Bible has a lot actually to say about it. But let me quickly say, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are defiled? What does it mean to be defiled by the things of the world? A lot of things can defile us. I warn our Christ, I warn our young people when they go into college. The one thing the enemy does in colleges across this nation is to defile the minds of our young people. Defile. And I and I'm using that word strongly. To destroy their faith. To defile their mind with with uh, lies, <coughs> not truth. I've been in I've been in so many courses where the where where, where the, the instructor was nothing more than an educated idiot. But they are trained to defile your mind. You remember when we used to have a Christian school, we would hire <coughs> teachers that came from Christian colleges and it'd always take us a year or more to even get their thinking proper. To have a biblical worldview that would be godly and understandable. And yet, see, the enemy is infiltrating every conceivable institution so that he can defile the minds of people. It's one of his tricks. It's one of his strategies. It's one of his ways. Now, this has to do with our lifestyle. The enemy wants to defile us in our lifestyle. Well, let's quickly go to number 15. One of Satan's, Satan's favorite lies <coughs> to tell is this, discontent. Discontent. Not satisfied. Make you discontent in your heart. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Be content. Have a peaceful heart. It goes on to say in 1 Timothy 6, 8, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Be content. Be satisfied. Philippians 4.11 I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. We don't, wanna, we don't want to be discontented. It's one of the tricks of the devil. Number 16. Delay to postpone either salvation or service. Now we know in salvation people can delay. Not today, not right now some other time. But people also say that in their service to the Lord, in their ministry to God. 
whatever God's called them, not today, some other time. And yet that's a trick of the enemy to get you to put off what God's called you to do. Hello? Amen. Now you know, every one of us <laughs> have been gifted. we got one or more gifts that God has given you and me of the Spirit. And one of the tricks of the enemy is to delay you using that gift that God has given you. There's 21 specifically, spe specifically spelled out gifts in the Scripture. My gift, spelled out in the Scripture, is to be a pastor and teacher. But he would have me to delay that. I've, I've known people that have been said they were called to preach when they were young men. And they put it off and put it off. And years later, 20, 30 years later, they finally come back to it. Well, it doesn't mean that God can't use them, but look at all the years they could have been used and are not because the devil tricked them into thinking that they could delay it and put it off. Well, delay is one. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. The psalmist said, I've made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. I didn't delay. Two more. Disobedience. 1 Samuel 15, 22, 23, Samuel said... That the Lord is great in the light in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Disobedience. Disobedience is a direct disobedience, a direct rebellion against the command of God. Disobedience. It's one of Satan's ways. That he calls it. The Bible talks about, Paul talks about the children of disobedience. <coughs> In other words, they're just, they're just, their whole lifestyle is to disobey. I call it the Laverne and Shirley kind of mindset. Remember that, that, that TV program? Give me a law and I'll break it. And a lot of people live that way. Give me a command. I'm not going to do that. I don't have to. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. Knowing not that they are being tricked by the enemy to disobey, blatantly disobey the word of God. And it's a deception. <clears throat> All right, number number eighteen, last one here. Debt. Some people won't think that this is an issue, but it is. Proverbs twenty-seven seven twenty-two seven says, "The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender." When we think about unrestrained borrowing and debt, what happens with that? is that it makes us vulnerable to be tempted in a variety of ways. And uh, it also makes us an enemy, to, it also causes us to be slaved by the enemy, having to work long hours to pay the debt that we've incurred so that we have no time for God, we have no time for service, we can't afford, we say and tell ourselves we can't afford to give because we're too far in debt. And uh, my point to that is you have to give your way out of debt. If you want to be blessed by God, you give your way out of debt. But it's one of Satan's tricks to hinder the people of God. Because then they can't be generous with the work of God. They can't be generous with the kingdom of God because they're up to their necks and eyeballs and in debt. They can't give like they would want to give. They can't do what they would like to do. You ever know anybody that had to take a second or third or fourth job in order to just make ends meet? Well, it's one of the tricks of the enemy to get you and me so far in debt that we can't be free in God to do the things that God wants us to do. Well, those are 18 different devices that Satan uses to get at us. Okay. The, the thought that just crossed my mind, now all of these 18 things, how many are subtle? Like the frog being boiled in water. Mm -hmm. It's not going to come up and slap you across the face with them. It's going to come in slowly but surely, inch by inch, until you're in the point that you're in stress. Right. Yep. Yep. 
it's always little by little. <clears throat> it's always hiding the consequences of such things. Well, thank you for coming this evening. I know this has been a, a little different uh, Bible study tonight, but I hope it's been beneficial to you so that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. So thank you, Lord, for this night. Thank you for your word and for what you mean to us. Lord, as we gather together in the house of God on Sunday morning, we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon each and every one. Every home, every family, every couple, every child, every Sunday school room, every Bible class. Lord, let your Spirit so overwhelm us that we will worship you without restraint. Lord, that we will honor you and give you all the glory that's due your name. Lord, we pray for our sick and afflicted that you will heal them and encourage them in this hour of need. Lord, pray for our church family that you will bind us together with cords of love that cannot be broken. Lord, that you will just continue to have your way with our hearts and our lives. Bring us together Sunday morning in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.